Hello, doctor. Hi, you are. Thank you for giving me time. And uh, you are out of your very busy schedule, which I can make out because I have been asking you for this time for such a long time. And you have not been able to find time at all. And it's absolutely amazing that you know, and you're very, uh, very, I should say, very impressive that in the middle of the night you have to get up uh, because there's a call and then you have to catch a flight and then go to another city yeah. for uh, harvesting liver and bringing it here. Yeah. And there's that time constraint also during which the liver transplant has to be done. Dr. Rajesh Day, Senior Consultant, Liver and Biliary Sciences. Max Super Speciality Hospital, Vaishali. Master in Hepatobiliary Surgery from Henri Bismuth Hepatobiliary Institute, Paris. MRCS from Royal College of Surgeons of England, 2008. MBBS from Medical College, Calcutta, University of Calcutta, 2000. Experience. Junior Consultant, Center of Liver and Biliary Sciences, Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, New Delhi, December 2014 to January 2017. Clinical Attachment from Department of Hepatobiliary Surgery and Transplant, St. James's University Hospital, Leeds, November 2012 to July 2013. Clinical Attachment from Department of Hepatobiliary and Pancreatic Surgery, Hammersmith Hospital, London, July 2012 to October 2012. Experience in Clinical Skills, General, Hepatobiliary, Pancreatic Surgery and Transplantation, Organ Retrieval and Implantation. Godrich Karai Fellowship 2005. Research Papers and Publication. Innumerable national and international presentations slash conferences for specialized training. Vast experience in management, leadership research from renowned hospitals. Memberships. West Bengal Medical Council, India. Delhi Medical Council. Royal College of Surgeons of England. Association of Surgeons of India. General Medical Council, UK. So... Uh, it would be very nice if you could tell my viewers, tell me also, mm -hmm. that as a layman, what is it, how does a liver function, yeah. or uh, not so much about the functioning, but how we can keep our liver well in good health, mm -hmm. so that uh, we can, you know, we can prevent all these very serious mm -hmm. diseases like some of the hepatitis mm -hmm. which, uh, infections which don't even have a cure, no. or if there is any new cure that you can tell us about. Right. So I'd like to structure it in two ways. First, I'd like to tell you about the basic thing about liver, what is a liver and what it, it, what it does for, uh, in our body, how it helps us. And then we can move on to the part about uh, liver diseases and how we can keep our liver healthy. Yes. Yeah. So in the beginning, as I'd like to point out, that liver is one of the largest solid organs in the body. <coughs> it is located somewhere over here. It is protected by the rib cage and other structures and uh, basically the liver's functions are manifold. It has a huge number of functions to uh, long to enumerate in a program but mainly its function is to detoxify your body. You know, detoxify number one. Number two is to digest all the food materials that we help in digestion of food materials and apart from that it is produces protein, it produces uh, uh, some form of carbon. Fats also, cholesterol also, some form of storage, carbohydrates like glycogen. So, and it is an, one of the important uh, immunity uh, providers of our body. So it has a myriad of functions which keeps us healthy, it keeps our blood uh, from clotting off or it keeps our blood soluble. <coughs> I'm sorry. So it does, it has a, it has a wide range of functions. Multiple, multiple, multiple functions. functions, yeah. So that is the, what the liver does and uh, and it is uh, often involved in the mind. multiple uh, disease processes can affect the liver. It has an, uh, the, the remarkable ability of the liver is that it has an ability to regenerate and repair itself. So it can tolerate a lot of insult and it keeps on tolerating all throughout the day. A lot of toxins get uh, absorbed, it gets tackled by the liver and then it takes care of them in its own way to keep our body healthy and toxin free. And apart from that, it takes care of different infections as well. But are we also poisoning our liver by consuming things which we should not be doing? Yeah, that has been, uh, that is there, but uh, like most importantly, you can mention alcohol. Alcohol taken in moderation is obviously 
taken care of by your body, by different body systems, by, by, by the liver. But when it goes beyond a certain limit, which is measured in terms of units per week, at least as it has been put, and uh, then the liver gets damaged. Its ability to cope up with the system uh, fails, and then we have all sorts of problems. And it is an often uh, the commonly used term called cirrhosis of liver. Yes. And all those things happen if we don't uh, drink alcohol in moderation. But apart from alcohol also, even non-alcoholics, uh, you know, abuse their liver and sometimes, you know, some things which are done in a good intention can also mm -hmm. turn out to be bad. For instance, thinking of, you know, some, uh, I was seeing, I was reading just before coming here, that uh, what could be the causes for liver damage and one, one of them could be, you know, using these uh, juices, these raw juices mm -hmm. of vegetables, of leaves or uh, even the herbal medications, yeah. which are not standardized. Yeah. So, if you could throw some light on it, that is it really good, you know, because it is very commonly advised that you must, if something is wrong mm. with you, then please have locky or uh, bottle gourd mm. juice or bitter gourd juice mm. uh, in the raw form. Yeah. So, please uh, yeah. tell me about it, uh, so, should we do that? Yeah, so what is happening now is we are living through a pandemic of fatty liver disease. Yes. So that is, uh, though it, it's not killing us in a day, or it, uh, so it, its effect is not as obvious as the COVID pandemic was, but it's, it's rampant throughout the country and in different parts of the world. And India being the diabetes capital of the world, it, uh, fatty liver disease is affecting a lot of Indians as well. But the problem with fatty liver disease is that the liver, a lot of fat accumulates in the liver. And in most of the cases, the liver copes with it, but uh, in some people, in a small fraction, the, the fat keeps on accumulating, it keeps on damaging the liver, and it also ends up in cirrhosis of liver. And more and more yes. number of patients we are seeing every day coming to us with cirrhosis, not because of alcohol, but because of uh, prolonged fatty liver disease and diabetes. So that is a major area of concern for not only for us as clinicians, but also for public health specialists yes. in India. And uh, coming to the point that you were trying to make uh, about uh, herbal uh, supplements, that's a very dangerous territory. One of my very close colleagues have recently gone into a lot of trouble from the courts and because of this constant lobbying by this herbal medicine group and all those things, because they don't want the truth to come out or they don't want people to understand the potential damage that can be caused by such medicines and all those juices that you have uh, spoken about. One, uh, so I will really not go into such a dangerous territory. I don't want to get yes. in trouble. No, but that is, that is yeah, but, but that I would rather like to comment on one or two things. Like uh, there is something called like Giloy. And yes, Giloy leaf, Giloy leaf, Giloy leaf and uh, Giloy things. And uh, there have been published reports in standard medical literature that Giloy leaf has known to cause liver damage. People have gone into acute liver failure because of Giloy leaf use, yes. and they have ended up needing a transplantation as well. So. Though many of people will come and argue with me and all the traditionalists and all the people who think that uh, Giloy has been there for 5,000 years and it has been part of our golden civilization and all those things, but the standard literature to prove that Giloy juice taken in certain inappropriate amounts can cause liver damage. Yes. And there are similarly, one of the more important things that we did in our day-to-day -day practice are dietary supplements for weight loss, which are considered to be quote-unquote and, and inverted commas naturally. We never know what is there on those dietary supplements and people take them, they get liver damage and in the worst case scenario, they come to us with liver failure for the transplant. So those are areas where a lot of research is being done and a lot of uh, contentious issues come up because we like to believe that uh, something which has been around for many years is likely to be healthy, likely to be more beneficial, but recent evidence, recent research is shows that it is not like that and people are coming up to us with liver damage quite a bit. Yes, and there have been newspaper reports mm -hmm. and I have uh, spoken about this in some of my earlier videos also that there have even been deaths because of these uh, raw vegetable juices, mm -hmm. loki juice and karela juice. So that is definitely something to think mm -hmm. about and a cause for alarm, absolutely, yeah. because it's a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, uh, you know, this uh, something called copper toxicity. Yeah, yeah. So having, you know, this is also an advice that mm -hmm. is given to people that you keep water in a copper vessel. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, even now I'm seeing that uh, copper is being marketed, mm -hmm. uh, copper glasses and copper flasks mm -hmm. and even uh, water filters having yeah. a copper container. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the body needs copper mm. to a certain uh, extent, copper is needed. Mm. But uh, is this advisable that you keep water in a copper vessel? Because some ions do come into the water. If you are keeping it overnight. Yeah, I think those also come with uh, the standard precautions and standard cautions that you shouldn't use it for a prolonged time or you should, you know, take a break from using it continuously. 
So uh, it's it's not that you have to use it continuously, or you can you need to take a break or give it a break sometimes. Number one, and there is there are some diseases where the copper metabolism in the body gets uh, distorted. One very commonly known disease is called the Wilson's disease, where a person's yes. ability to you know metabolize copper and uh, deal with copper in the body gets uh, distorted. So on, on those people should not uh, you know get uh, more copper overload, as to say. So uh, that is there, but uh, we don't know who has Wilson's and the anterior acid manifest, and it affects a very small minority of our population. So I'm not like to generalize that everyone should stop drinking for copper things, but there is a limit to it and there is a moderation to it, and yes. uh, it should not be done in perpetuity or in continuity, thinking that it's good to be good for health. It's better to give it a break after maybe one or two months, and then you know come back to it after some time. Uh, another uh, cause for concern is, you know, that there are some diseases, some hepatitis types, yeah. for which there is no treatment. Yeah. So, what does one do once one gets it, or mm -hmm. how to prevent it? Two things that are uh, that we should prevent it. Mm -hmm. But if at all somehow it does creep in, mm -hmm. then so if you if you are calling about hepatitis, the word itself means inflammation of the liver, or inflammation is when a body part or part of the body gets inflamed, there is infection, or for whatever reasons. So one of the common reasons for hepatitis is, like you have mentioned, we are discussing drug-induced hepatitis, yes. like uh, some traditional medicines or even some allopathic medicines if, uh, can have a side can effect, have a effect and cause hepatitis, that is number one. Other is viruses, there is a group of viruses called hepatitis viruses and they can cause significant liver damage. One of them is hepatitis A virus. We often find children coming to us with a lot of jaundice, yellow eyes yes. and all those things because they have been eating out and uh, hepatitis A virus mainly spreads by the water waterborne disease. Water -borne disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that can be, I, with our current uh, water supply things, it is impossible to avoid it. But if public health measures are taken to ensure portable water, then I think those things can be uh, curtailed. And there is also a vaccine for hepatitis A which is available nowadays and it is recommended for children as well as for adults. And uh, number two is there is an entity called hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Yes, yes. Yeah, hepatitis C mainly spreads through blood contact up to needles and all those things. And luckily, over the last decade, fantastic medicines have come uh, in, the, in the in the in the industry, which cures hepatitis C. Previously, used to get patients with hepatitis C with cirrhosis of liver, and they used to get a liver transplant. But nowadays, with the new medicines which have come up, almost 99 to 100 percent cases of hepatitis C can be cured by those medications. So this has been a recent positive development in terms of hepatitis C. Hepatitis B, as you know, is also spread through blood or through unprotected sexual contact and all those things, and it is important. But there is a vaccine for that in hepatitis B also, and it is in included in our universal immunization schedule for. In the Indian children, and all of us, I believe, should have a vaccination, especially healthcare workers should have a vaccination for hepatitis B to protect us from the hepatitis B. Okay, very important. And what are the uh, cases in which there is or you uh, there is need for a liver, liver transplant, or you could uh, maybe share with us uh, your experiences of even going to other countries mm. for uh, performing these operations, yeah. and uh, which are the countries that uh, you were called to, okay. and uh, why and what kind of treatment did you get? Right. Yeah, liver transplant is a fascinating field of uh, medicine and surgery. And uh, the first transplant was done in the mid 1960s in America. And you have come a long way from that over the last 60, 70 years. And liver transplant, you have to do it in two scenarios. One, one is an acute liver failure in certain conditions when the liver has failed acutely, it has given up, and the patient is quite sick. And there's no chance, we don't think there's a chance of the liver to recover spontaneously. Then we do go ahead, and go ahead and do a liver transplant. And the other scenario is when the liver has been damaged progressively for different causes, like as mentioned in the fatty liver, alcoholic liver disease. And then you need to go in and do liver transplant for cirrhosis of liver. These are the broad main reasons why liver transplant is done. And this specialized field has developed in India since 2000. Uh, it has got a lot of focus. And in India, the most commonly performed transplant operation is when a person, a relative, donates a part of his or her liver to the patient. So that is called living donor liver transplant. And the other way of getting a new liver is if someone dies and he decides to donate and the family member agrees, then you harvest different organs like liver, kidneys, cornea, livers can be. So in India, it's mostly living donor liver transplant. And uh, 
as a transplant surgeon and part of a unit and because transplant surgeon is not a single person's job it's, it's, it requires an entire team, team of people entire team. or medical specialists of multiple surgeons who have spent years working in this field and uh, and if you talk it up uh, in that way it is really a made in India story this living tra donor liver transplant because we have gone to different countries to set up transplant programs in other countries like in Nepal, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh because the, the, we have helped and uh, them, their local teams grow and they have picked it up and now they are doing it independently. So we are extremely proud of what they have done. And it, we keep on going to other countries also like Uzbekistan, the Central Asian countries where cirrhosis of the liver is very common and there is no uh, recourse to transplant, there are no recourse to that. So many patients uh, suffer over there. So we go them and see them and help them in building up uh, their capacity to perform liver transplant so that people get served in that way. Is there any other uh, precautions that we could take? Uh, for instance, even I have fatty liver. Mm -hmm. So what should I be doing? The, the simplest and the best treatment for fatty liver is uh, regular physical activity, number one, and to keep one's weight under control. I would not like to go into the contentious issue of what diet should be taken or not should not be taken, but uh, in general it is broadly accepted that if we reduce the number amount of carbohydrates in our diet, it takes care of fatty liver and uh, in addition with weight loss and physical activity that takes care of fatty liver as such for fatty liver a uh, lot of research is happening new medicines are coming up but there is no single medicine till date which has been proven to be uh, so effective like in hepatitis c as i was talking about it uh, takes care of hepatitis c so till now with ongoing research i think we will soon get medicines which takes care of fatty liver as well but till, till date the best the cheapest is to avoid the soft fizzy drinks, especially for the children, to avoid food which is cooked with a lot of salt and a lot of, you know, a uh, lot of uh, refined flour and things like that. Not uh, So those are really damaging the younger generation as well as the anyone who consumes it, I guess. Anything else that you would like to do? No, it has been a pleasure. Give no, us no. an advice. Oh, the liver is a fantastic organ and it is taking care, so you shouldn't bother about detoxifying your liver. The liver already gets, uh, does its job well of detoxifying itself, so all those detox and things, I don't think how much they are effective. There are a lot of uh, videos and you know reels and things about where people uh, keep on uh, telling about detoxifying this, detoxifying that. Our human body is a fantastic organ and every organ knows what to do. So. Just by keeping ourselves healthy, just by looking and be careful about what we eat and what we consume, we can keep ourselves healthy. So how frequently should we go in for the liver function test? Yeah. Uh, that I think because that will give us a, a, a picture of liver in advance that you mm -hmm. come to know. Otherwise, the, before the body gives any symptom, if we come mm -hmm. to know. So what should be that frequency? Once you, are, you have a diagnosis of a fatty liver disease, you should meet a liver doctor or a medical doctor. And then you will assess you by different tests, by an ultrasound, so there's something called a elastography, and multiple other blood tests, the extent of the severity of your disease, and if it's okay, and and the, really the frequency of your tests will depend on what those initial test results are, and yes. how you can go for a yearly checkup, or you can, depending on the severity of your disease, some doctor may advise you to do it every six months. So it's not there's no no rigid framework to uh, get yourself checked up. Depends on your last life reports and not your medical doctor feels about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. For sparing your time. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you.